When you first got there, did you do the precision bombing, or did you immediately go into the fire raids? Well, Marilyn, we had built up quite a reputation over in India and China on our high explosive and precision bombing with the um, northern bomb sites. And you know, we, we bombed 10 different countries from Mukden, Manchuria, clear down to Singapore and, and Palembang or Saigon. Uh, we, we had a real uh, history of, of doing good bombing. So This when was we, out of India? Out of mm -hmm. India. So when we came to China, I mean to Tinian, we expected to be able to do the same thing. But again, by this time, we found that the weather was preventing us and we would only mm -hmm. be able to fly maybe two or three missions mm -hmm. a month from altitude using the bomb site. But by this time, General LeMay had found great success back in March and April until they ran out of incendiary bombs with trying to destroy the cottage industries because, you know, let's say that, that Japan isn't as big as the state of California. And so there are three, half a dozen main cities of Tokyo, Osaka, Kobe, um, and those cities were, were heavily populated. Tokyo was probably the biggest city in, in the world. And so the factories turning out airplane parts or uh, any war materials didn't have big suppliers or subcontractors like we did in the United States. They had cottage industries where people in their homes would turn out a little piece or piece uh, or some part and move it over to the factory. Mm -hmm. So when we were trying to hit the factories, we weren't actually we weren't destroying as much, much as, mm -hmm. as we were mm -hmm. when we started to burn out mm -hmm. the, the housing. So that's why the decision was made then by General LeMay to go in and just do uh, just bombing, non-target non bombing, just to go up and blow up the city basically to get rid of the cottage industries. And uh, they well, did this with incendiary, in, how do you say the word? Incendi incendiaries. Incendiary, which are fire, right. fire bombs. Now the napalm bomb that was most used for the incendiaries was called the uh, K-69. And that was a mixture of a couple of chemicals, napoline or something and a palm something mixed with gasoline which formed a jelly and it was turned out primarily by standard oil and so the incendiary bombs were about this size the little k-69s but they'd be wrapped about 20 or 30 of them in a mm -hmm. cluster to form the same size as say a 500 pound uh, high explosive bomb precision bomb mm -hmm. and when these incendiaries were dropped then they when they got down to a certain altitude, then they would burst apart, and that was forming fires that couldn't be handled mm -hmm. even in the best of times by mm -hmm. the Japanese. And it, there was so much confusion on the ground and so many fires that mm -hmm. their d departments couldn't do mm -hmm. it. So we warned the Japanese that with with leaflets that they should get out of town, we were going to bomb their towns, it was going to destroy them mm -hmm. and their families. And early on, the Japanese had moved their children, as the British had done early on in their war, away from the center cities and out into the country to save them. So um, we had great success with these incendiaries. And we were destroying the factories too, because uh, mm -hmm. these, these small homes or plants that furnished the parts to the factories were put out of business. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, after the war, we found that it was even more successful in destruction and, and uh, all than we had thought. The absenteeism and the lack of good morale and, and all for the, Chinese, uh, for the Japanese people uh, really made a big change. We felt sorry for the, mm -hmm. You know, it's like it is now. We got Saddam and, and other terrorists around. Well, there's always been, through history, a lot of bad guys. Well, Tojo and some of the Japanese military people 
had control of the Japanese, and they weren't even uh, informed about the progress of the war. And it was a real sad mm -hmm. thing after hearing that they were never going to be bothered to suddenly find that their cities were being destroyed and many people were, were losing their lives. Describe a fire raid. I know it was different altitudes. It was, what, five to yeah. 6,000 feet, and it was done at night. Well, gee, my first mission uh, to Curry were, it, uh, was the Japanese Navy was stationed in the Inland Sea. Gee, there were over 300 airplanes in the sky, and formations all coming in. We're all trying to hit the same target. And so we even had bombs from some of our own formations flying through, so that we were worried about that. But then at night, flying alone, and if you got, well, by the time we started hitting Tokyo and Nagoya and Osaka and Kobe on those night raids, we were even up to 500 airplanes. And, you know, we're all going through, and there was some separation, but uh, we worried about being rammed by our own planes. And so a lot of us would, uh, fly along with our, our navigation lights on. The red for the right and the, and the green for the thing, and it blew lights over on the top thing so that your, your buddy wasn't going to run into you. Well, it was actually, a, uh, you saved on fuel, didn't you? At least by going through there, and oh. you saved the engines because you didn't have to climb right. to the great heights, and, now, see, uh, and, and you saved uh, the formation time of organizing and Right, Setting because on a up. daylight mission, you had to fly up at a low altitude, and even though by this time we had taken Iwo Jima, uh, we still were using that as a navigation aid because it was just about halfway up to Japan. So I would always try to fly a couple, three miles away, and then we were at low altitude until we got within 100 miles of Japan. Then you had to climb up to 20. 5,000, but when you went at night on their missions, on the fire would, raids, on the fire mm -hmm. raids, we would get to eat about four or five o'clock and take off by six o'clock, so that we actually were then could figure six seven hours for our trip up there. So it was midnight or a little after before we dropped our bombs, and then on the way home another six seven hours if you didn't have to ditch or land at Evo in an emergency, and so you could land during daylight hours. Now that was a big help because when you flew the daylight missions, you were taken off at night and you were having to land at night. And uh, with that B-29 and, and its bad visibility with all those little windows in the nose was um, difficult to do anyway. Mm -hmm. So it must have been kind of, well, all bombing missions are scary, I know, but wasn't it scary going in there at night and in a fire raid and just people just dropping bombs everywhere, no specific target? Was it scary to be in the air yeah, when all that was going on? It was scary, and I was lucky. I was one of the um, pathfinders or lead crews, and so we would take off a half an hour or so or more before the main force would do it. And so then we would usually drive uh, or fly up there and drop M47s, which were bigger bombs, to light the target area. So that then when the main force came and they either came around downwind uh, around Mount Fuji or they went up Tokyo Bay off the Chosi Point and they had targets to hit because supposedly our lead crews were th the ones that did this. Well, uh, there, for, for a lead crew, um, it meant at night you were uh, going to get the bulk of the searchlights because they weren't spread around. Later, the Japanese decided there, there were too many B-29s going through without being in the searchlights, so they said they only wanted four or five searchlights to a plane. Well, that, that, that was a, a, a bad deal mm -hmm. to be 